you for this time together. We ask that you'd give us uh, grace of our clarity of thought, that we speak the truth in love, and that we uh, elevate uh, Jesus in his name. Amen. So this is a chart from uh, my book, I'm Glad You Asked, which came out a number of years ago. Uh, we've done a couple of editions of it, and we're going to be doing a revised edition very soon. But uh, it's a question, a series of questions that surfaced. I think this book came out a long time ago, about, about 1982 or something like that, because we found that all the basic objections that we encountered to Christianity consisted of variations and combinations of 12. And so the first one relates, uh, if we go from general objections to religion to specific object objections to Christianity, and then more specifically, problems of clarification regarding the gospel. So if we order the questions that way then, how do you know there's their God and all the variations thereof? Um, what about the miracles? Hasn't science disproved the miraculous? That sort of notion. A third, isn't Christianity just a psychological crutch for emotionally weak people? That's the one we're going to address today. And then re the reliability of the Bible. And we did a series, uh, a, th a three-part series, on how accurate is the Bible. And again, you can find all these at uh, reflections.org. Uh, uh, so if you just go to type that in now, um, you can see that they're on YouTube videos and we're making them accessible. So it's a way of looking at that. So that was yet another question about the reliability of the Bible. Now, a huge one, as you can well imagine, is how could God allow the innocent to suffer and all the variations that that entails as well, all kinds of areas. But this, again, there are combinations and variations of this, these basic objections. Getting more specifically, uh, specific then, how can Christ claim to be the only way? And then, of course, the following question we just addressed is, what about those who never heard? There's also the objection about the hypocrites. Because, to be honest with you, if, if, if that's what Christianity looks like, I have enough problems of my own, you see, when we look at some of the people. Because some people who claim to be Christians, they look like they were weaned on a deal, dill pickle. You know, they're nasty people. Some of them are just uh, very unkind. Or all the hypocrisies that we see, all the, all the hate rather than love. Didn't Jesus say, it is by their love that you will know them, that the uni unity and diversity that is necessary there. So that becomes an objection. But then when we get down to the gospel, as it gets clearer, then the question about what about good works? Can't a sincere person then work his way and earn his way and various variations of that? Uh, that's just too simple. The idea of salvation by grace through faith, that's just too simple and it is variations. And then what do you mean by believe in the first place, you see? And then finally, how can you be sure of, a, of salvation? Is there any way of really knowing about that? So we're going to be working our way through various of these objections, and that's why I thought it was, would be a good idea to summon that up. So as we look at this our first question, this question then, we're looking at one of the 12 basic questions, and is Christianity just a psychological crutch? And again, these are things that when I hear I want to turn objections into opportunities. So rather than being intimidated by, what if they ask me this question or that question, what will I say? The reality is you don't have to have all the answers in order to share your faith. But rather, when a person raises a question and you don't know the answer to that question, that's a learning opportunity for you. So rather than being intimidated by that, this is actually a process of gaining skill by use, by practice. So suppose a person asks you a question and you don't know the answer to that. What should your response be? Well, that's a great question. And compliment them because if a person's really thinking about this, that's a question we ought to consider. So if we raise this question, isn't it just this a psychological crutch? It is a good objection because what do you do with that? You see, isn't it possible that that's the case? Now, if you don't know the specific answers to the thing, though, what I would recommend then is saying, let me look, at, look, look into this and get back with you. 
and we'll have a talk about that if you like, you see? Now what you've just done then is that you've acknowledged that you don't have all the answers, you never claimed that you did, but you've given yourself an opportunity then to do some work and some, some research, and then when, you, and you've also given yourself an opportunity to meet with the person again and review that with them. And that's a very good thing because you learn by doing. As I've said before, if you don't know the answer to a question the first time, you're not responsible. But if you don't know, have, know the answer to this, the same question and you're asked it again, now you are. That's how, what it comes down to. So it's a way you learn a skill by doing and by practice. And so this is just one of multiple questions. And what you'll also observe sometimes is that there'll be combinations. Sometimes a person will hit, hit you with two or three of these all at once. And you could be overwhelmed by that. And again, all you have to do is to say, I hear you saying this, this, and this. Let's start with this, and we go from there. Any questions in that process? Because um, that's an important method of doing this. Any, any questions on that concept? Um, there's another thing I would like to mention to you, and I've alluded to this before. I call it um, really um, dialogical uh, apologetics. What I mean by that is that you actually have a dialogue. And the most effective approach with people is to ask them questions rather than you always being on the defense. Instead, I find the most effective thing we can do is to ask a person, well, what do you think about X, Y, or Z? And then based upon their uh, answer, then you would then say, listen, you'd listen carefully. That's, that's interesting what you've just said. Well, help me then with this. And so you're simply asking them a question you listen carefully and ask another question based upon their answer. And then it continues to go that way. I have found this to be a very effective thing because it shows that you're interested in what they're saying, but you're also helping them think through another stage. And if you do this long enough, it's very frequent that uh, people will paint themselves into a corner. It's most intriguing. Because you see, people cannot live consistently with the logical implications of a non-Christian worldview. They can't do it. So for example, a person claims that uh, whatever feels good to you is, is, is okay. So their idea of morality, if it doesn't hurt anybody, that sort of a thing. But then you'd ask them questions about that. So let's, let me make sure I understand it then. And then you'd ask them a question about that. And, and from there, based upon their, well, I don't mean that way, or that there's no such thing as evil, but then why would you be upset by so-and-so? So it's just, but not being adversarial, this is the key, but rather really genuinely wanting to hear what they have to say, and then based upon their answer, you having listened carefully, ask them another follow-up question, and that's how that goes. And so they eventually came to come to realize, in many cases, I've had this happen multiple times, when, they've kind of painted themselves into a corner. They, they can't live consistently with that. And they kind of give birth to their own understanding, you see. And it's something that they didn't really want to uh, realize, but they're forced to do that. Now, the interesting thing is then, uh, they have to own that baby. You see, I'm a cognitive obstetrician. You see what I mean by being a cognitive obstetrician? I'm helping give birth to ideas but I'm birthing it out of them. It's not my idea imposed upon them. It's just that they begin to realize that this is the way we are and this is the way we live. So you can't speak about evil without applying a good and that kind of a thing. Am I making sense there? So, so when they give birth to an idea, it's their idea. So they have to own that child, as it were. So it's a, an illuminating thing. Now, I've also found that there have been cases when this did occur when people still were not ready to actually bow the knee. There's a volitional barrier, as you know. It's not just an intellectual barrier, you see. And that's where the Spirit of God works in, works in this. Because a, per, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You can show them that this is true, but it will not really sink in. I've seen that happen again and again. In spite of what's happened there, if they're not ready for it, so they can be convicted, but they're not ready to respond in repentance. That's that sort of, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit, as after all. Um, and I've, I've told you before that there are different kinds of objections. There's an emotional barrier 
there is an intellectual barrier. And third, there is a volitional barrier. With the emotional barrier, the emotional barrier often caused by bad experiences. A lot of people have had very bad experiences or associations with Christianity, with religion. And so there's a, an emotional barrier. And the way we overcome that is actually by being a safe person and building a relationship there. So where love is felt, the message is heard. So you can actually build a bridge that overcomes that barrier. With the intellectual barrier, you're turning objections into opportunities and you begin to realize that there are answers to these things. We have better access to answers than ever before. And the new information that keeps on piling in from archaeology and other evidences of manuscripts and so forth continue to actually amplify our case, not diminish it. And so the intellectual barrier, turning an objection into an opportunity, but then the third is the volitional barrier, and that is the barrier of being. It is a barrier where people are in their natural disposition at enmity with God. And you cannot overcome that with your logic or reason, even with your love and relationship. That can only be overcome by the Holy Spirit. So that that's where you pray, because only there will that occur. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? Those, those? We also have to remember, it has to be done in humility. Uh-huh. Because all of us, it's a free gift. Yes. Okay, not that we did, and to earn. That's correct. So there's a mindset of humility because the realization is that really we're coming to the end of our own self, our own resources, and realizing that uh, our own approaches never did work. And you approach this in humility. You're sharing something because you found something and so you're sharing it with another person, you see. Again, the idea of a, a beggar uh, fi finding bread, sharing where you can find more. So it's a certain notion then that actually one of the reasons why people have struggles with it is because um, it offends their pride in many ways, you see. There's a matter, matter of humbling oneself. That does not come naturally. So there you have the prayer. Only the Holy Spirit can break that barrier. So understanding that larger context then and realizing there are certain questions that sometimes come singly or uh, in, a, in concert and often they'll, you'll hear two or three of these and then you break it down. So in this particular instance, I'll just spend a short time on this uh, question that does surface from time to time. Isn't it just a psychological crutch? And the variations wouldn't be, would be along these lines. Isn't Christianity, like all religions, just a crutch for emotionally weak people? So, so kind of a general, uh, glittering generality that some people have. They figure all religions are just for emotionally weak people, or they just created God in order to cope with the future. And so the Freudian notion then that God is a projection of humanity and so forth, and that we need to have some kind of a thing or the super ego and all of those things. Um, all these naturalistic explanations then would say that this is just something we invented so we could have a sense of, of, of meaning in this, in this really truly meaningless world. Or another a variation, why should it matter what you believe as long as you have a sincere faith, you see? And again, it's this idea of sincerity, uh, whatever your faith would be, you see. So the problem is people can be sincere, as you know, and sincerely wrong. And we, we, we well re realize that. And then if you were raised to believe in God, how, can you ever deny that preconditioning? So the, supp the supposition here is it's, you were preconditioned uh, to believe that. So those are some of the variations of this question. And what if I don't need religion? You see, I, just some, something that I think is just an illusion. Fine if people want to do that, but I don't think I need that kind of a mindset. And so essentially what we're saying are, is that there are two basic uh, answers to this question. Either it is just subjective or it, there is an objective reality to it. And that was, that's what it comes down to. If it's objective, then there's more than just feeling, isn't it? You have to deal with the facts. So we first of all look at this whole concept what do we mean by this? And the, when we're speaking of psych psychological in this context, uh, it would be existing in the mind or reality as it is perceived. And uh, the, in, if an experience is merely psychological, that is to say, if, it must be, if it's just totally subjective, then there's no objective data to substantiate a conclusion. And so they wouldn't have any force. It's just what you feel. 
And by the way, as you probably have observed in our time, people have moved away from facts to feelings. They've moved away from actual evidences that are common and can be shared and understood collectively to an ignoring of those kinds of evidence. They're no longer interested in empirical warrant, nor are they interested in rational consistency. Then what is it based upon? What I decide I want my, myself to be, you see. So ideology now trumps all kinds of things. It, ideology trumps reality is what's been happening in, in, on multiple fronts. But so when you've got that mindset then, if, you don't ha if your view is not based either on um, actual empirical warrant, in, you know, evidence of the senses and what have, or if it's not based upon reason, it have, if it has no connection with either, then you're, you're, you're basically, you are, your feet are planted firmly in midair. You see, you, you're living in cloud cuckoo land. You have no connection with this reality. So I could just as well say, uh, if I want to say that, well, today I'm going to identify as X, Y, or Z. And why, if you buy that motion, notion and then allow that, that idea to trump, then I, if, if I could, for example, do um, the idea of gender identity based upon my feelings, why couldn't I also make, be a different species? I think I'm, today I'm going to be a lion, or I think I may be an aardvark. Um, the idea, but, and, to, and tell me what basis would you say that's not true if the other is also true? Because not, if ideology trumps biology, then why not? So you could play that game with species as well, but that's another story. Um, but there, we, we really are living in an area there that's disconnected from objective reality. And the Christian vision, the biblical vision of truth, has always emphasized that this faith that we're living in, that we're discussing, is a faith founded on fact. You see, it is not something that is just I, an idea. And that the, my, my argument has always been that the, that the heart cannot rejoice in what the mind rejects. My heart cannot rejoice in what my mind rejects. And that's why I'm very interested in what's called Christian apologetics. What does that mean, or Christian apologetics? It sounds like you're apologizing. I, I'm sorry, I was just raised that way. I can't help it. Um, that's, not what you, that's not what the word means. What does it mean to you? Apologetics. It's a major field. Defense of the faith arguments, yes. So apologetics means to, to actually to give a case, to set forth your case, you see. So I'm going to render my apologia, my defense. It's a defense of the faith. And a, Christian apologetics has been, there's a rich, rich history. In fact, I wrote, wrote a textbook on Christian apologetics called Faith Has Its Reasons. And I look at the various approaches to, to Christian apologetics. It's a hugely important topic. And there is a need then to see that this is a faith that is founded on reality and not something we're making up. So I'm very big, a big believer in that. But I'm also a big believer in having the reality, not just head knowledge, but also a knowledge of the living God who makes himself known in the gospel. So that it's not a matter of just having a head knowledge of Jesus, but also a heart knowledge of him. So that to, to know him personally, experientially, relationally. So that's why I'm also interested in spiritual formation. So I think of on those two levels, the spiritual formation um, and also apologetics, because they go together. You see, we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all of our mind and our, our, soul, our soul, our mind, our strength, so the inward, outward, so that it has always been a matter then of being, knowing, and doing, of, 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 of basically heart, head, and hands. They, it goes together. So this is uh, more robust, going back to where we were then. Uh, the two options that we have then before us are very simple. Either it is a subjective experience that has no objective reality, or it is an experience that really does have objective warrant, objective basis. So a little logic then, if we stop and think about it, but before, before examining these options, 
We should make, let's make it clear that a position is not rendered false just because it is completely subjective. This just removes it from the sphere of investigation, you see. Um, and so the, if, if Christianity can be relegated to a state of total subjectivity, then we'd be hard pressed to prove the validity of our claims. But uh, we have to realize though that this is a comfortable place where people have tried to land but it doesn't really work very effectively for, uh, for good reasons. And so uh, it really is um, more the issue of, is there any real basis in fact for this faith? Is it a faith founded on facts? Now, when we as soon as you hear the question, a uh, psychological crutch, it's already loaded, you see, uh, because when we stop and think about uh, this, this idea, a crutch assumes the, the uh, uh, presence of a problem or a need, and it assumes uh, the, a supply of aid or assistance to that problem. And major, major skeptics of religion, such as uh, Sartre and, uh, and uh, Bertrand Russell and Marx, why we only have his beard in this picture, I don't know, but you know that's Marx, you just, you just know it. And this one also, even though you only have the bottom, you know who it is, it's Sigmund Freud. Uh, it's, these are iconic figures in our character, in our time, because they have shaped our culture in so many profound ways. And so there, the, the notion is that um, uh, Marx, for example, would say that, um, or, well, Freud would say religion is for the emotionally weak and uh, for those who can't cope with the future on their own, and Marx would say it's a problem is economic and so forth. Um, they're trying to be reducing things down to it's kind of uh, redu reductionism down to economics, down to, uh, to any number of things in terms of relationships or pain or any kinds of areas. But it's more than that because I will acknowledge that uh, it can be a thing that deals with uh, fear. And of course, um, highly emotional and weak people have in fact um, uh, seek relig sought religion uh, because they're too insecure, perhaps, to face a future on their own, and there can be a case that can be made for that kind of a thing. Uh, there, there are some, may, we might say, that invent their own gods to assist them through life's burdens and woes, and there are a whole lot of ex examples of that, growing numbers of things. The gods are growing in, in abundance according to whatever a person wants it to be. And so uh, even the gods of AI and that kind of a mindset as well. So you can say that. Uh, Christianity is often portrayed in this way, uh, especially in the, in the media, as a kind of a caricature of an escape me mechanism, again, for emotionally needy people or variations of that. And though it can be a crutch, it doesn't mean that it always is. So it's just that that objection, that metaphor, uh, doesn't really work very well. But um, there are psychological objections that people have used. And one of those objections is a preconditioning. A second objection is that belief and emotions determine truth. Uh, and then the third is that it re experience determines truth. So we're going to, I'll, I just want to say a word about these basic uh, objections. So the first one is preconditioning. What do I mean by preconditioning? Well, some, try to, some people try to invalidate uh, the, the believer's claim uh, to be objective. They say that they were pre preconditioned to believe in Christ. They were raised that way. What would you expect if you were raised in a Muslim home? You'd probably be a Muslim and so forth. And um, there is some force to that, but essentially the fault, there are some false assumptions. Um, the assumption, of course, is that all were raised in Christian environments, and that's certainly not the case. Uh, this, there are many uh, con uh, you know, converse experiences of that. And then many came to Christianity out of religiously hostile or neutral environments. So you really can't reduce it to that. So there are some people, and when I love to hear people's life stories about how they came uh, to, to Jesus, and my own background was, a, there was a religious background. So when I was a child, my parents sent uh, my, my sister and me to, uh, to church. They never went for, uh, for most of those years, but they sent us off, and so we kind of dutifully did that. And I remember, you know, that was fine, and I went to Sunday school class, and I 
heard the sermons and so forth. And then a new pastor came who was a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, and I connected with the guy. I liked the way he was thinking and so forth. And after a while, I kind of had an intellectual experience where I kind of embraced the idea. It made, it, it, I could see, because the guy really made the scriptures applicable, and it made sense. And even as a kid then, I began to realize that there was more to it than I had thought. So I began to, I came to conclude that these things really were true. I was also involved in a, a, in a Christian version of scouting. So have you, any of you heard of Boys Brigade? Have you heard? You've, yeah, I was involved in Boys Brigade in my church. And so I would... Um, my friend, we'd play these games and do all these things, and they'd have a talk and so forth. But I remember what was happening, that they, they, someone would present the, the message of Christ, and sometimes afterwards they'd be invited if, if anyone wanted to go and pray a prayer. So they'd go into this other room and pray a prayer. And more of my friends who were in part of Boys Brigade were, were telling me that they prayed this prayer, so I figured I shouldn't be left out. So one time... I, I, I went in there and prayed this prayer. And, uh, but what it was, I still remember the guy praying a prayer, and I listened to it and went along with it. But it wasn't really, it was an intellectual assent, but it was not a personal reception. You get the difference? It's huge. So you can give assent a, a to the idea that something is true. I can believe about Jesus. And remember, I've often mentioned this, a person can go to a church for 40 years and know the creeds and recite these, the, these things so well. Be exposed to that and believe the creed and not know Jesus. You can have religion without Christ. Isn't that so? And there was, was multiple people having that experience. In fact, Wesley himself wrote a little booklet called uh, Religion Without Christ because at first he was like a missionary didn't re and realized he didn't even know the gospel. He knew it, but he didn't know it. It was in his head, but not in his heart. And I still remember when the pastor of that church would give a sermon, sometimes I'd get really convicted by the thing, you know, but then I'd have to work up some kind of an experience feeling that that, that, this, that uh, prayer I prayed must be real. So it was really kind of an attention thing, because in my deepest heart of hearts, I knew it wasn't real. It was just in my head and not in my heart. I blew it off when I went to college altogether, went to Case Institute of Technology, became a scientific humanist. I didn't reject Christianity, I just didn't want to think about it. And I was in a perfect environment because I was in a context in which for four years, I still find this hard to imagine, for four years I never count, encountered one person who claimed to be a Christian in four years, not one per in my fraternity or anyway, uh, it was intriguing. I can now look back and a couple people in my fraternity I think were closet Christians. I can guess, they, which I think I'm right about that, but they never would dare to say it because if they said something like that, the whole, the, 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 all the guys would then try to disabuse them of that delusion, you see, because that would be something that would not be acceptable. So it was a more of a rationalistic, scientific, humanistic sort of a milieu in which I found myself. And uh, for a lot of reasons that I won't go into right now, um, there were, I had a great, an, an extraordinary encounter with God that I didn't initiate and effectively then forced me into the realization that I didn't really have that relationship with him. And eventually then I came into a point where um, it was an extraordinary realization of the good news of Christ and it took the road less traveled because it turned out to be a choice that I had to make and I had to do it not just to go along with something. So it was a very powerful experience indeed. And on that very, very night, I still remember that I knew that this book, that I'd learned verses about when I was a kid, you see, when I... And when I went off to college, I knew some verses and things like that. I realized for the first time that this book was not just something fanciful, but it was something that was real, and it was God's blueprint for living. And so I just knew I needed to learn it. And that's why I went off to a seminary, not because I wanted to become a minister, but because I just got to get my head around this thing. This, if this thing is real, it's the blueprint for living, 
wouldn't I want to know what the creator may, told us to how do we live? It's the, it's the owner's manual. It's the, it's, but he's the owner, you see. And he, we, we are the device. We are the person. And he tells us, here is how you were designed. This is what you were meant to be. This is what life was meant to be like. And this is what hope and faith and love really look like. And I'm going to call you into a deeper and richer understanding. And I'm going to show you that all these things then matter because everything matters. I remember after a year at seminary, because it was a crazy experience uh, for me that for first uh, year, it was very hard. I was going through worldview transition. Um, that suddenly I had a kind of an epiphany where I came to understand that my word, everything I've ever learned suddenly makes sense. They connect together. I had a comprehensive, coherent, consistent, and clear worldview that enabled me to see whatever I'd learned in literature and music and science and history. It all fit together because I had a framework. So what I'm saying here is that it's not that you're not defined by your background, but it could be that you have a non-religious upbringing and you come to faith, or you can have a religious upbringing and you don't know Jesus. But you see, it's an independent of that. Any questions on that concept, though? This preconditioning notion, yes. What are the preconditions? What would be the objective evidence that you're that or that you're Yes. Um, he's asking the, object, the evidence that we are meant to worship something. At the end, um, we look at the human condition, realize we are inadequate, we are lost in the, in the cosmos, to use Walker Percy's image. Uh, and so the idea here is how do we then find ourselves? And the reality is that unless there is some, uh, something beyond us, something objective, something transcendent, then if, we're, if it's just a matter of, of mutations and natural selection, and that, then there's no real meaningful hope. So if you really bought that philosophy and thought through its naturalistic assumptions, it's not a livable philosophy because we live better than we would actually claim. If the, for the naturalist, the materialist, the, the, the one who claims that sciences and, and, and materialism or naturalism go together, which is not the truth, um, for that person then, he would actually have to say that um, he treasures, values, loves certain things that aren't warranted by his system. All he should be doing is being a vehicle for his selfish genes to reproduce, you see. So in, instead of caring about and nurturing people, he should actually be a predator and a promiscuous one so that he spreads his seed as well as he can. So being a predatory and promiscuous would actually be consistent with the logic of that kind of notion that you were only here to, re, to, to reproduce your selfish genes. Am I making sense here? We live better than that. We live as if they're really, that people are worthwhile and they're meaningful. But what's your basis for claiming that people have boundless value? What's your basis for human dignity if you are just food for the worms when you die, for example, and that you're a product of the impersonal and you will go back into the impersonal? Yet we know better than that. We treat people with dignity because we recognize they have boundless worth, you see, but unless they have, are defined by the transcendent, there's no basis for it. In other words, your worldview does matter. And if you have a materialistic worldview, you don't have enough basis for anything that you actually truly do believe in. You think that there are some things that are right and wrong, and you know it. So that some things are beautiful and ugly, and you know it. And some things that are true and false, and you know that. And that is an intriguing thing. That's, by the way, why many people who are not believers are still attracted to things of beauty. For example, if you consider uh, Tolkien's uh, the, the Fellowship of the Rings, the, the whole the Lord of the Rings trilogy, there's a beauty to that that has drawn many people who do not know Jesus into that realm. And they don't know, that, but they're being romanced into a richer realm that is actually based upon a theistic understanding of the world. They're drawn by, through beauty into goodness and truth. And that's, a bit, that's I'm a big believer of doing that myself. And, and to, Pursuing that. So that would be one of the thoughts along that line. What, any other questions? Yes. Um, 
it's obvious to me to say that we're all for the, the colonialism and not just to tell them apart. It, it calls us to worship something. And <clears throat> yes. Um, because he, as he put it in one place, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their heart in you. And that's the first paragraph in his confessions. And so he says that we can't help it. And if you fix your, your joy, your well-being upon any object that's less than that which is transfinite and transtemporal, it's not big enough for you. It, you were meant for more. So you meant us for yourself then, and our hearts are restless because no other earthbound good will suffice. You are meant for more because you can't help it. Eternity was planted into you. Ecclesiastes 3.11, he put eternity in your heart and you can't eradicate that longing for, for more because you are a bearer of the Imago Dei, the image of God. And as a, as a bearer of that image of God, first, you're a spiritual being. Secondly, you're a relational being because God's a relational being. And third, you are also a being who manifests the transcendentals of beauty and goodness and truth so that you are an aesthetic being. You are a moral being and you're a rational being. You see, all that is because you're an image bearer. So it gives us true basis for human dignity and human destiny. But if you have a narrative that actually says that we've come from the impersonal and we're going back to the impersonal, it's not enough to sustain any robust hope at all. And people want to live with meaning and value and purpose because they try to do so. And that is really, they live more consistently with the logical implications of the biblical worldview than they would want to admit. In fact, that's my, so my view is that's the case. No unbeliever can live consistently as if Christianity is, is false. And it ultimately, that, that, that the biblical vision of God and reality is what we actually move toward. By the way, I'd also say that just as the non-believer lives better than his worldview because of the image of God, the believer lives worse than his worldview because of, of the presence of sin. Do you see the idea there? So because of this indwelling sin, this world, the flesh, the devil, and this pull and so forth, we would actually be living less than our worldview. And of course, our great call in this life is the movement from the immaturity to a rich, richness in which we become more Christ-like so that we have not just spiritual excellence but moral excellence becoming like him and then being like him, that enhances relational, uh, relational excellence, you see. So it's an inside-out process. But um, we've, so this, this is really where we are here. We'll, we'll pick it up, not next week. Next week we have, I think, a parish meeting so we'll be using this, this place. But the um, preconditioning um, is this notion then, um, and then there's a false, uh, a second false assumption then. If a pre pre person is preconditioned, that, per that position is not valid. Um, so what I'm gonna probably do here, I'm gonna go into, I'll talk about preconditioning, and then um, we may have enough time to do this, actually. Yeah, let me just go ahead and do it. Um, if a person is preconditioned, his per position is not valid. But that just doesn't work. Um, and the, the assumption also is that preconditioning does not make a, pers a, a position true or false. And so this is, this is my point here. That uh, does my the real question is, is, if I was preconditioned, is there any warrant to it? So for example, um, we, many of us, were preconditioned in our youth to believe um, in Santa Claus. And it's most interesting how I played that game is and milked it for all it was worth. So even though I re realized by a certain age that this is, this, the Santa Claus is my father, he, Santa even wrote notes that look suspiciously like my dad's, I figured I'm gonna play with this one for a little longer because I'm still getting gifts from Santa as well as my parents that work with. So uh, when I came back from college, I finally admitted I didn't believe it. No, <laughs> it served me very well though for a period of time. So 
So I went along with the game, you see. So I was conditioned to believe that, but reality, the evidence of reality, began to show it didn't work. Whereas on the other hand, I was also preconditioned to believe that fire is extremely hot and that you don't want to touch, that, uh, touch the stove with your hand. And I, a painful reality demonstrated that to me more than once. So there comes a point where it's not a question of preconditioning. It's not doesn't validate or in, invalidate a position. It's the investigation of the validity of the claims. Is there any objective basis or any objective warrant? So that's the uh, first of these objections. Then and then we're going to be going to the other others as well. So I'm hoping this is just helpful in just thinking things through together. Because come, let us reason together. We want to think in a worldviewish way. You see, it comes down to these things. Your fundamental questions. Where did I come from? Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Identity. Who am I? Why am I here? In other words, what's my purpose? And where am I going? What is my hope? And we all need to have a transcendent warranted basis for identity. Who am I? I'm who God tells me I am, not the world. And purpose, a biblical purpose, not just buying into and imitating the purposes of people just because they happen to be um, moving in those directions. No, a bigger, a bigger vision of purpose. And what is my hope? To live in light of the understanding that I'm only here for a few years. And I better be transferring my hope to, from that which is passing away into that which will endure. Father, we thank you for this time together. We ask that you'd guide us into your truth. Your word is truth. Amen.